us this evening. My name is Grace Ward. I'm an associate director um, in the Fund for Davidson office, and I'm joined tonight by my colleague, Judith Rolls, who is the senior associate director uh, in the Office of Alumni and Family Engagement. We are really thrilled to have the opportunity tonight to welcome each of you for this really special edition uh, reunion back to school class featuring Bonita Pizor Zumbach, um, class of 93, Chad McCall, 93, Matt Spear, class of 93, and then Donna Peters, class of 1989. Uh, so before we get started, a few Zoom keeping items that we want to make sure that we go over. Um, all participants have been muted. We ask that you remain muted um, throughout the event so that our panelists are able to um, we're able to hear our panelists speak tonight. Um, if you're comfortable and have not already done so, um, please consider changing your Zoom name to your first and your last name. Um, you can rename yourself. You'll click the participants button at the bottom of your screen, hover your mouse over your name, and then you can click the more button um, and rename yourself there. If you have a Davidson class year, uh, please feel free to add that one as well. The chat feature will be available tonight, uh, but if you have any questions for the panel um, throughout the presentation, please send them through the chat to Judith or I. Um, we'll organize the questions um, for Bonita to ask the panel. She will not be monitoring the chat and neither will the panelists. Um, so please don't send any questions directly to them as they won't see them, um, but send them to Judith and I, um, and we'll hopefully do our best to get as many questions um, answered as possible tonight. For optimal viewing, I recommend um, hovering your mouse at the top of your screen, right at the top of the black Zoom screen. You'll see um, something called view pop up. If you click on that, select speaker, you should be able to see all the panelists pinned to your screen when we begin. Um, we've also enabled live auto transcription for this call. So if you wanna enable that on your end, you can hover over the live transcription button um, on your screen, subtitles should appear. Um, please note, this is not always entirely accurate. Um, so we just ask for your grace and understanding if a word is misspelled um, or otherwise mistaken, but know that that's a feature that's available on your end. If you have any other tech issues um, or anything throughout the conversation this evening, please send a chat to Judith or I, um, and we'll be happy to troubleshoot with you. Um, all right, so now for our program to get started, our moderator tonight is Bonita Pizor Zumbach. Um, she is class of 1993 and is a marketing strategist based in San Diego, California. Uh, after graduating from Davidson, she began her career in nonprofit fundraising and development. She worked in Charlotte and then later Vancouver, um, British Columbia. In 2000, she relocated to San Diego, where she transitioned to B2B marketing and publishing, commercial real estate finance, franchise consulting, and tech. Post-COVID, she started marketing consulting with small to medium-sized businesses and nonprofit organizations. So, Benita, we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Grace. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. It's great to see so many classes represented on today's back to school session. This topic seems to be top of mind for many of us. We have some terrific members of our Davidson community who are going to share their own stories. I'm going to start by introducing our panel. Then our subject matter expert is going to set the framework for today's session. So I'll start off with Chad McCall, class of 93, who is based in Austin, Texas. He was an economics major at Davidson and is now associate priest and chief of staff at St. David's Episcopal Church. Matt Spear, also class of 93, was a member of the legendary 1992 Final Four men's soccer team. Based in Davidson, Matt has started his own life coaching business, Love United FC. And welcome to our special guest, Donna Peters, English major from class of 89, who is our subject matter expert. Donna is actually a full-time career coach who wrote an award-winning book called Options Are Power and also hosts an award-winning podcast, The Me Suite. Donna is the innovator in residence at Davidson's own Hurt Hub for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Welcome. So Donna, I'm gonna let you kick us off today. Um, as a career coach, you have considerable visibility to the inner workings of professionals who are in flux. Why mm -hmm. is this topic today particularly timely? Yeah, so I'm broadcasting live here from Davidson at the Hurt Hub for any of you who may recognize my background today. This topic is so timely and I am always so impressed when people make time to invest in themselves in this way. The topic is so timely for a few reasons. We've always known that at this season in a life, there are many of us thinking about what do I want the next horizon of the way I allocate my time, treasure, and talent to be. And that would be just true in the way that we reflect on our lives at this age and in this season in our careers. What do we want? Are we living at the intersection of our values and our passions, et cetera? But this got exacerbated through the last three-year period that we have been living through with the pandemic 
that really started many of us doing a lot more personal reflection than we had been doing in the past of uh, what is my legacy? What does it mean for me to wake up every day being energized and, and focusing my energies in a way that fulfills me? So I did see over the last three and a half years in my career coaching practice, a lot more self-reflection about the role that we want work to play in our lives. Because if we are career professionals, we are awake working or doing something related to work, more hours in a day than we're awake not working. And that's why it's so critical that we put work to work for us. So a little bit of a, of a trifecta of the natural season of where we are in, in our lives based on our age, the fact that we do have the privilege of being very thoughtful at this moment about how we're going to focus our time, treasure, and talent. And then with an exclamation point put on that by our shared experience of the last several years going through the pandemic. Fantastic, excellent information. So I'm gonna start with each of our panelists. I'm gonna let them tell their stories. And after we do that, we're gonna do a little Q and A internally, and then we're gonna open it up for questions. So Chad, Let's start with you and your story. Talk to us about what you've been up to. Yeah, so I guess after I graduated from Davidson, as you said, I had a, my background was in economics. I moved, my parents had moved to Atlanta while I was in school. And so I went to Atlanta and actually then went to grad school at Georgia Tech and got my MBA and then went out and worked in uh, healthcare technology, um, selling software systems to hospitals. And then I worked for a, um, a venture capital fund in Atlanta and in Southeast Florida. And so, but still also still working in healthcare and information technology and did that for about 10 or 12 years um, until my early thirties when we started having kids. And uh, it was around that time when I experienced a, a call to go into ministry. And so then went through the discernment process, which takes a little bit of time and then went back to school. So then went to went back to the Carolinas actually. So I went to Duke for divinity school. Um, that was a three year process. And then uh, we moved back to Austin and then I had to start um, kind of finish the discernment process in the church. So while we did that, uh, my wife and I at the time started a home health care company um, and we did home health care here in Austin providing senior care, elder care services. And then uh, finally um, began transitioning more full time um, into the priesthood and into the ministry. Um, and now work at a uh, at a Episcopal church here in Austin, downtown church, and um, I'm a priest and, and chief of staff. So I run kind of our programs team, um, adult formation, children formation, um, kind of all of the formation groups. And here I am, ready for our thirtieth. So Matt, um, let's hear your story. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, Benita. Great. Um, yeah, Chad, thanks for sharing that. Um, and I think kind of like Chad, a lot of us in this time of our life are recentering around things like service and community. Maybe we proved ourselves at the corporate ladder or starting our own business or um, trying to be a titan of industry or what have you. And now we're shifting to, to different ways of, of serving people. And that's certainly um, in, my, in my situation. So after uh, Davidson, I had a sports marketing career, um, worked with Ann Todd uh, and among a few others on the call here, some other Davidson alumni. And that peaked when I turned 30 and was a little bit burned out uh, from starting and running a startup, but uh, was fortunate enough to get the head coach job at Davidson and um, went back to alma mater to coach there for 18 years and didn't feel like a job, um, really felt I lived a mile from campus and working with student athletes um, and getting to know other colleagues uh, in the athletic department, professors, and all of those from a different perspective, no longer as a student athlete, was so gratifying. But after 18 years, like many of you probably, just same job, same place, and, and regardless if it's good or bad, you're just itching to get out. And one thing I started to do at the end of that 18 years is to start to just have coffee talk with different kinds of people um, here in Davidson at Summit and just pick their brain about what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, Carol Quillen was a regular uh, coffee mate of mine at the time. So I was fortunate that um, five of my Davidson teammates um, bought a pro soccer team in Richmond and asked me to come in and be the president and general manager. 
And for my third career, once again, I had no idea what I was doing. So just, you know, figuring it out. And that kind of cliche that Davidson doesn't prepare you for one thing, it prepares you for everything. But in that year of 2019, I started to, to face a lot of really personal trauma and pain. And that really shifted my identity. So a few uh, tough things that happened to me that year were first and foremost in April, um, my college roommate, Arthur Moore, had died. And, um, and that was really, uh, you know, a, a really tough situation for me for many reasons. And then that summer, my college coach, Charlie Slagle, died who was my first hire in Richmond and my dog died and my mom fell and the job was really hard. And I was commuting 300 miles, 49 straight weeks for my family. So it was a really, really trying year professionally with burnout and stress and anguish. And at the end of that year, um, my marriage failed and that was very painful. And that was a tipping point for me in early 2020 for the first time to really experience depression and mental health challenges. And that went right into the pandemic and George Floyd's murder and the tumultuous political year. And so both from an external and internal, I really just had to completely restart and shift. And so when I came out of that transformed, um, I might add, uh, and really wanted to look at um, this kind of this work-life balance and really shift it to life-work balance and really focus on being overdoing. So I became a life coach and um, I can talk more about that during the Q&A and what I do with that. But it's really trying to do, among other things, um, transition some of my pain into purpose and to take some of my skills and experiences um, through this new prism of post-pandemic and help people handle some of the things that I have been through with stress and trauma and pain and come out the other side, hopefully invigorated and a little bit more true to their best version of their self. That's a, a powerful convergence of, of occurrences that happened to you. And it, it's incredible that you're able to transition that to something that helps yourself, but also helps and contributes to other people in your community. So I, I applaud that. So uh, let's switch gears. Donna, tell us about uh, your story and your journey. Yeah, I, I like to tell my story uh, sponsored by the number 20. Uh, I spent the first 20 years of my life as a child in a family-owned business, which I think shaped an awful lot about my entrepreneurial spirit because my, my parents owned a, a manufacturing business uh, that made medical examination tables. And then the what I call my creative 20s, uh, after I graduated from Davidson, I was a professional actor for 10 years. I taught English in South Korea, and I ran a restaurant with my then boyfriend, later became husband, chef, who was class of 90 at Davidson. And then I went to business school and I hit a reset button and I went deep, deep undercover in corporate America for 20 years in management consulting. And I retired from management consulting in 2020. And so in 2020, I went back to school again and did a certificate uh, program for uh, the neuroscience of leadership that allowed me to pivot into my career coaching practice. And maybe I'll be doing that for the next 20 years. I'm not sure. Uh, but my, my story has a lot of um, unusual corners in it, uh, many of them sparked by going back to school and, uh, and getting certifications, similar maybe to you, Chad. Great. So, um, Chad, I want to go back to you for a moment. What motivated you to actually decide to go in, go back to school and, and you know, heed the call? Yeah, so in my, I guess in my early 30s, I was, uh, my, it was my maternal grandfather's funeral, and um, I was just sitting in the pews. It's a little small town, um, church in farm town, Iowa, and um, in the middle of the service, I just had this sense the the local pastor was doing the service, doing the funeral service for my grandfather, and I just had this sense during the funeral that that's what I was supposed to do with my life. Um, mm -hmm like this just kind of weird, I couldn't even describe. I didn't tell anyone about it for probably a couple months because um, I thought it would go away. I thought it was like heartburn. It would just kind of, you know, it would pass, uh, but it didn't. It just kept, um, other things kept happening and it kept coming back up. And so finally I got the nerve to tell my wife at the time. Um, 
And she said, well, you need to go talk to talk to Pastor Ken, who was the, the pastor at our, the Methodist church we were members of. So I went and talked to Pastor Ken, and then the Methodist church has a very, or at that time, had a very formal discernment process that you go through. Um, because that's the thing, it wasn't just up to me to decide to change, like the church had to affirm, um, had to affirm my call and basically agree to support me um, going to seminary. So I had to go through that process, but then basically went through that process, got up the nerve to tell my classmates from Davidson and my friends. And um, I was kind of upset. Nobody was as surprised as I wanted them to be. I think I thought it was going to like, I don't know, but it was, uh, so it's fun, but it was definitely, it was scary um, thinking about it, verbalizing it um, and, and telling people and making it real. Um, what did you find the most surprising about that whole transition, aside from the fact that your friends weren't surprised? <laughs> um, I think the the process, um, it's just, it, it is a long, I mean, the church is very careful. And then I changed denomination. So while I was in seminary, I became Episcopal. Um, it just was a much better fit for how I'm wired and, and who I am and also my belief system. And so that meant I also had to restart the, the ordination process um, well, mid-school. And so I think I underestimated what the process was going to be like, because then after we moved back to Texas, I had to restart the process. And so basically had to go back to work for three or five years as I kind of went back through the process after going to school, um, which all turned out to be fine. I mean, just um, through the life stages of having kids and doing all the things, it, it all worked out, I think, in hindsight as it should, but the, the process was much longer and more complicated than I thought it was going to be. So I'm going to switch to Matt. You know, you kind of came to a point where you were trying to decide what you were going to do next. How, how did you decide whether you were going to, you know, get a coaching job someplace else or start a business? How did that, how did that come to fruition? Yeah, you know, even at Davidson, I, I, unlike a lot of my classmates, including on this call, um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I was a history major and um, thought I wanted to stay in sports in some shape or form. And I had, for the most part of my career, just different wrinkles of it, so to, to speak. But, um, but at, when I got out of my second season running that pro soccer team, honestly, I, I was getting better in terms of my mental health and, and starting to breathe a little bit better and starting to transition this new chapter, if you will. But I was still didn't really know where that was going to take me. And there were some moments in the fall, if I'm being honest, Benita, I was like scrolling, you know, uh, flights to Costa Rica, thinking about I'm just going to go down there and get off the grid and just just, uh, you know, unpack some things that have happened and, and life. And I think I was just about to turn 50 at the time, plus or minus. So um but I didn't do that. And a couple of things that triggered me in this next path or where I am now and where I'm going is one, some Davidson people really came to me and helped me out. Um, I remember one of my former teammates, Ross Salterini and the former business partner, class of 91, um, he, he really helped me kind of start my own business and, and said, you can do this. Um, and, and so that was helpful because I wasn't I was going to do it on my own versus with other partners like in the past. And then I also started to connect um, with some childhood team te friends. They actually were some teammates. They didn't go to Davidson. And so my first project was with, he's a psychologist in San Diego. His name's Dr. Brad Miller. And he played college soccer after we played youth soccer together at Wake Forest. And he reached out to me and wanted to get some feedback on a new project he was doing with soccer, which ultimately became something we co-founded called Soccer Resilience. And it just hit home because he was a psychologist that had suffered from performance anxiety as a Division I athlete. And I had seen that in athletes I'd worked with. And I had been through some tough times earlier in the year. I told you that. So it was just great synergy for me to learn from a psychologist and give back to the sport of soccer parents, coaches, players uh, with a psychology uh, a background of, of that he could offer. And so that was my first really project of my new consultancy. Um, and, and then my second one worked out where um, a, a youth soccer, a big club called NC Fusion in the Triad area, um, 
I jumped in with them and did a little bit of strategy work. You know, they, they had a white paper they wanted to do called the 2030 sports model, which kind of clicked in for me because I'd put together a lot of soccer projects and, and entities. And on the heels of that, it's the CEO, Scott Wallston, still a good friend, said, we want to keep you involved. What are you into right now? And I said, I'm really into mindfulness. I'm really into meditation, visualization. And um, he said, great, why don't you come in, join our staff, and every two weeks, you'll do mindfulness sessions for my staff. And that just then kicked off a whole other side of life coaching, one-on-one mentoring, purpose-driven stuff. Um, so long story short, just relationships and connections and being open about shifting a little bit was really important for me. That's great. I mean, I think Donna's really going to touch on this later on, but you know, leveraging your network, leveraging your skill sets, and then leveraging what, what your current passions are. So I think you, you, I mean, you did a great job of, of following that path, similar to Chad, who stuck it out despite having to make some significant changes on his journey to becoming a, a priest. All right. So my next question is, um, going to go back to, to Donna and ask, ask you, Donna, you've made a number of fairly distinct transitions over the years, acting, teaching, consulting, corporate work. What was going through your mind during each of those transitions? Because they're fairly significant and put you in very different points in your life. Yeah, I know that on the outside looking in, it looks like who are you and what are you doing? And it seems so crazy and disconnected. But in the moment, it was the most logical next best move. It was the most logical thing for me to be doing because it was so clear that it's what I wanted to do. And when I think about those moments, I call them moments that matter. I really honestly can tie every one of those moments to a mentor or to a person in my life who could see something in me that I didn't really appreciate in myself, uh, who was, uh, I, I guess it's kind of a combination of your, your being, you're your willing to be open to hearing that there's this other thing that people think that you can go do and be good at, and they recognize that you're really interested in it and passionate about it and supporting you to go make the change. I really, um, I know on paper, they don't, they look like non sequiturs, but in the moment, they were the most logical next thing that I could have been doing. Um, I, but I feel very fortunate and in full of gratitude that I had support around me to make those changes because I'm sure they, they would have been very scary without the support. Uh, but I also had um, a coach, uh, uh, a coach at that time who was uh, teaching me to continue to think in my mind, what is the worst thing that could happen if you've made the wrong decision when you decide to make this move? What is the worst that can happen? Well, really the worst that can happen is maybe I end up doing something for a year that I am not really that excited about, so I'll make another change. Maybe I spent a year of tuition that I don't think I should have spent if I decided to go back to school. But none of those things was disastrous or irreversible. And so that, that would be my, my one main thing for people listening. If they're really thinking about making a big switch and it feels a little undaunting and scary, what really is the worst thing that can happen? You're resilient, really, really smart people, and you'll figure it out. So that actually brings a good question. Did any of you have actually the worst case scenario happen at some point? in your changes and did you have something you had to overcome working with your family working with like your own self what are my actual skill sets can i make money doing this that kind of thing um anyone chime in nope all right well, we'll move I, on to the sorry go ahead, i'll jump in there i'll jump in there benita i think that you know for anybody um you know these kind of overachieving davidson types which many of us are <laughs> Um, we are fear of failure, um, and we always think our, our career has to have this arc and this trajectory, and it doesn't have to keep going up. And in fact, um, there's this thing called heroic individualism. One of my mentors and life coaches I look up to is Brad Stuhlberg has um, kind of coined this phrase, which is we can easily get caught that we're to show success, success and ambition. We always have to be achieving the next thing. And the problem with that is you're never happy. You're never content. 
because you're always looking for the next thing, you know, the next job, the next raise, the next house, the next car. And it can, it can really be tough. I think, especially when you get to around our age, most of us on this, on this panel are about the same age. Um, and oh, I think you might've frozen up for a second there, Matt. And I'll look at them and I'll say, how's that, how's that feel? How's that going? And it's just like a, they completely turn blank get stare because they're used to equating busy to success and um, used to saying, where am I going and what's going on with that, pro that with my job, what's my process. And so um, I think it, a good thing for people to consider is, um, is how busy are you? Um, and do you, Oh, you're frozen again, Matt. Hard. All right. Well, um, I'll, I'm going to move yeah, on. It could be the best thing ever. Awesome. So unfortunately, we did. You did freeze for a second there, Matt. Um, but I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, let's see. For those of you who had to go back to school. What was that like, um, being an older learner with a cohort um, that, you know, might be fresh out of undergrad? Uh, let's, let's start with you, Chad. I know you actually went back to Divinity School. Yeah, I was, I was, um, I was definitely one of the older classmates. Duke's a pretty young uh, Divinity School. Most of the students there were coming right out of undergrad. Um, but I have to say, I think two things. One, and not because this is a Davidson call, but I mean, I, I was extremely well prepared, um, you know, writing papers and doing all the things that I had to do, I had done, um, you know, <laughs> so I was going crazy while I was at Davidson. And so that wasn't a struggle for me, the academic piece at all. And I have to say too, you know, the last job I had was one of those places where, you know, you get there early, early in the morning and you're staying until late. And so, if anything, it was it was less of an hourly burden, and I had summers off, and I had spring break and Christmas break, and so um, thankfully it, it was kind of fun. And my uh, my daughter was about eighteen months when I started, and then my son was born while I was in divinity school, and so it was also it was a great time to have those breaks and to have the summers and to have that free some of that free time. Um, so I mean, for me, it was great in the academic piece. Um, I was extremely well prepared for from Davidson. So, I mean, it was an adjustment, um, but it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't an, an overbearing hurdle uh, at all. That's encouraging to hear. Excellent. <laughs> Donna, what about you? I know you did go back and get some certification um, to, to, for your business. Yeah. How did that work out for you? Yeah, I have uh, two master's degrees since Davidson and then this uh, executive coaching diploma program that I did. Um, and I am faculty at the Executive MBA program at Emory's Goizueta Business School in Atlanta, where I live. And I have an MBA student in my class this summer who is 49 years old. And it's a one-year MBA program, and he is going back to school, and he's doing great. <laughs> so if there is anybody out there who has an itch to scratch about going back to school, at least give yourself the opportunity and the grace and the freedom to do some due diligence, just to explore it. You will always be in control of saying no if you decide not to do it, but go and just figure out what your options are. Is it really too expensive or not? How long would it really, really take? Would you really be the, young, the oldest person in the class? Maybe, maybe not. Um, my father did not finish college until he was 52 years old. And so I did have him as a role model, and that was a long time ago. Um, I had him as a role model as an older learner. Uh, and then now I'm seeing it in real time, even today, um, how uh, older learners uh, can be very successful and you can find your tribe. So if you've got an itch, at least go explore it. And you're always in control of saying, no, you don't want to do it. Matt, how about you? What about what kind of certifications and things were you involved in to uh, become a, a personal coach? Well, actually, I didn't do the life coaching track like some people do. Um, 
life coaching, there's so many varieties of it. There's so many different um, variables with it. So actually, I've leaned in more toward my background experiences of starting and running a business in my 20s, being an 18 year head coach, um, running a pro soccer club. So honestly, I'm, I'm cool, more kind of self-educated on it. Um, I have dived into really the last couple of years, particularly, as I said earlier, focus on the mindfulness piece. Um, but the well-being pillars that, that I really try to cultivate within and for others, I've got that because of all my background before. So um, for me, I've been a little bit more on the, on the self-educated side. Um, that's worked well. Good. Now, I mean, it sounds like you've done a good job of leaning into your core competencies and experience. So that's fantastic. So, I mean, that's a lesson for everybody. You know, you don't necessarily have to go back for an expensive program in order to start a business and, and consult and that kind of thing. So I think that's fantastic. You've got great experience. All right. Um, this is a final question before I'm going to turn it over to, to Donna. Um, I want each of you to tell me and, and our audience today, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your 22-year-old self? So let's start with Chad. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, looking back, I mean, I, I mean, I have to say first, I don't know that I would have done anything different uh, than what I did. I think it was the right path for me. But both my daughter's a is going to be a junior in college and my son is going to be a senior in high school. So I think the advice I, I would give them too would just be, you know, I think a lot of us try to follow, and, and I might have done some of this. We would follow in our parents' footsteps, or you know, the the paths that are laid out before us, and and not to be afraid to take risks when you're young, um, and and to you know, if you want to go live in New York City, go live in New York City, or um, take that job that you're not sure how it's going to work out, and and take those risks because. Um, certainly you can do things in your twenties that, that get harder to do as you get older, although all of us navigated change. Um, but I think just giving that freedom to really think about also what you want to do, what feeds you, um, what are you passionate about, um, and what really drives your heart, because that's, that's, what's going to sustain you over the course of a career, um, is, is dipping into that something that you're passionate about and something that really feeds you. Donna. You're the average of the five people that you hang around. So choose wisely. I like it. And back to you, Matt. Um, probably just to remember that keeping well-being top of mind. So even as you drive, I work with a lot of, you know, athletes and coaches and high, you know, uh, successful organizations is you can grind, but that's not sustainable. Um, so making sure that as hard as you work, you also have to rest and recover um, because there's so much burnout and stress. And I'm a big believer that health and happiness uh, interconnect and that mental and physical health interconnect. Um, so I think just being more holistic um, and and giving yourself some grace um, and also that you can do your own path. It doesn't have to be anybody else's um, and, and just be yourself. Great. All right. So I'm going to switch gears now and um, turn it over to Donna. So Donna is going to offer some practical tips and advice for anyone who's thinking of making a, a change or changes like you've heard about tonight. So Donna, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, I wanted to share a little bit of a framework. And if, if any of you are ever interested in some free resources and tools around this, just private message me on LinkedIn or find me in the Davidson Alumni Database or whatever, just find me. Um, and I'll see, send you some links to these uh, free resources. But basically, the, the framework is all under the context that options are power and that we know from neuroscience and the social sciences that when we feel that we are in control, then everything else falls into place. This whole holistic view that Matt was just talking about. We know that when our brain feels that we're in control and we're not trapped, that good things happen all around. We make better decisions. We sleep better. We have lower, lower blood pressure. We have less incidence of depression, et cetera. So the way to surround yourself with options, if you're thinking about options for career, 
I'm assuming it's for a career. The first thing I would recommend you do is know what your core values are. We talk an awful lot about core values at companies and posters on walls, and we talk about it in onboarding training, but what are your personal core values, the non-negotiables that you expect from yourself and others? Because those should be the filters that you use to make these big decisions about what your next best move is going to be. The second one is do the work to look yourself in the mirror and really understand what is your personal brand. Because that personal brand is what you're signaling out to the universe when you're trying to think about what my next best move should be. And that will attract. What you signal is what you'll attract. And so doing that personal reflection about your personal brand, I find so important when it comes to thinking about your next best career move. The third one is your networks. And we've talked about relationships and networks and reconnecting with all these wonderful humans in our lives. Relationships are like bank accounts. They require deposits and withdrawals. So think about things that you could start doing as easily and quickly as Monday to be making deposits in these relationships so that when it's your turn to make a withdrawal, they are there for you because you've been nurturing them. The other one is to think really broadly and creatively about your skills and strengths. I find that we get so pigeonholed and so narrowed often when we're in the grind or when we are working in a, in a main one area for such a long period of time, we often forget about and shut off some of those amazing talents and strengths that we have. Remember what they are and rekindle them if, you, if you're needing to at this moment. Think really broadly and creatively about those skills and strengths. And the last one I would say is really, really focus on your storytelling. The why am I interested in making this next move? Why am I uniquely suited to add value to it? And why is now the time for me to do it? Of all the things that I find at this season of deciding about what our next career move should be, this is where I find people are the weakest. We're really good at updating resumes. We can get better at updating LinkedIn. We can reach out to networks and activate that, even though sometimes it feels a little awkward. But where we really fall short and don't practice enough is on our storytelling of why do I want to make this next move? Why am I uniquely suited to do it? And why is now the time that I want to do it? So I, I would really practice that if you're finding you're at a crossroads. Uh, and whatever it is that I hope you get, I hope these tools are helpful and let me know if I can help you offline. Excellent. Thank you, Donna. So one of the questions we got um, in from our audience, there seems to be some value in finding a mentor. Um, how do you go about finding a mentor when you are middle-aged? It's a lot easier, obviously, you know, when you're just coming out of school and you're early in your career, but, you know, it's kind of humbling when you're 50 and trying to, you know, forge a new path. What would be your recommendations, Donna? Hmm. Well, there's maybe an embedded assumption in there that a mentor has to be older than you. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So if you were thinking that a mentor has to be older than you, I would first uh, you know, check that, bust that myth. Um, and then the secondly, I would look around at people who were doing things that you just have a general curiosity around and call them up and ask, can I spend 20 or 30 minutes talking to you about how you decided to do that thing? Or how did you make that pivot? Or what can I learn from you? I find generally people love to help people. There's no greater compliment than to get a phone call and somebody says, I'd really like your advice on something. So maybe think a little bit differently about what the word mentor means to you. And it doesn't mean necessarily the older statesman. Uh, a, a mentor, we do a lot of reverse mentoring in career coaching too. A, a mentor could be the 30-year-old who maybe took the risk to do something that you would now like to be doing. So I, I would first maybe uh, bust that myth and make the phone call. Excellent advice, excellent advice. So this other question has just come through. Do you think you found your true calling or are you open to future career changes? I'm not sure if it's directed to anyone in particular, but so let's uh, have each of you respond to that. Let's start with you, Chad. Yeah, I mean, I think I have. I mean, I think I see what I do as continuing to shift over the next 10 years or so. Um, I mean, one thing I've experienced is I, I have a tendency to get pulled back into my old life a little bit. Um, and so that's how I ended up becoming chief of staff and doing some things. And so am I frozen? 
We can hear you. you are, we can hear you, but you're you are frozen. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But I was just saying. So I think I've have been pulled back at times into my old life and doing things that pull me back more into management and less into the priestly role or pastoral role. Um, and so I see myself leaning a little bit more heavily into the pastoral role over the next 10 years um, and finding more opportunities to do that. Um, so not really changing my calling or my career, but maybe just continuing to lean more heavily into it um, as, as, I, as I get older. Um, let's see, a question is coming through now as we type it through, give us a moment. Okay, I'll go into this next question about education. Um, what role do you see alternative education such as community colleges or sort of certification programs or even professional development playing um, as someone switches careers? What's I think it's on? Sorry, I interrupted somebody. No, go ahead. Uh, I think it's the future. I think all types of paradigms are being busted being about busted the way that we learn. And uh, if what's available to you is community college, you find the course that you're interested in to go learn how to code in Python or become more knowledgeable on generative AI, uh, take the class and be constantly curious. It's not about the pedigree of the diploma. It's about learning the knowledge where you have this, your general curiosity uh, as I, I would lean into it. Right. Democratization, democratization of yes. education. Absolutely. Yeah. Our, you know, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, our, yeah, our diocese has a program and um, the average age is people in their 60s and 70s who are going back and um, becoming ordained, basically going back to school, but it's designed so they can take classes on the weekend. Um, it takes four years, but they basically go 10 weekends out of the year. Um, and, and go and, and get a, a version of an MDiv um, so that they can seek um, either or seek ordained ministry. Um, and again, their average ages are 60s and 70s and they're going back and doing this because they've always wanted to do it and now they have the flexibility. Wow. Great. See, our next question, did you find that some people around you were initially not supportive of your change or um, discouraging? Uh, let's go, uh, Matt. What, what What are your thoughts? Um, it's funny because I actually said some, said that Ross Salarini, class of '91, helped me get my new business started. He's a former CPA and he was CF, CFO of a company that I did. And it's funny when I told him my name of my company, Love United SC, he joked that no uh, red meat eating American CEO was going to be able to write a check to something you know that that is that soft of a name. So um, it's kind of a joke, but kind of not a joke. Um, but when you want to lead with authenticity and vulnerability, which I do, you've got to do it your way. Um, so I, I kind of deflected that, that criticism and it's been fine. You know, no one cares what your company's called. And in fact, I think Donna said it earlier, you want to be true to yourself. Like, what is your story? And I, and I told you a bit about my story earlier, and that comes across as more meaningful um, if you can really lead with your own voice and your own perspective and your own experiences. Uh, and then it also makes the work a lot easier. So, you know, when I work with coaches or business people, whatever, like, I think that storytelling that Donna said is critical. Then, then it doesn't feel fake. It actually feels genuine and people will respect that more. Um, the other thing I was going to say um, is if you do, do a uh, career shift, it doesn't have to become a full-time career, a full-time job. Um, my example, honestly, has been just the opposite. Um, my son's right behind the, the TV or the screen here. He's 15. And he asked me recently, he said, Dad, are you ever going to get a full-time job again? Um, and I said, not that I don't, not, I don't think so. Not really. Um, so I have like part-time projects that I do, but I know I'm a better dad. I'm healthier. I'm more self-aware. I'm more available um not having to work full time and to piece things together and you'll be surprised what you can find um if, if you do if you do it well so for example this is going to like 
something that's really off off the grid. I thought I never would do this, but my one of my main clients, probably my best paying clients, I um, am a life coach for 22 NASCAR drivers. And what we did today is we played pickleball. So I got played to play pickleball and then do a mindfulness session with NASCAR drivers. So you, you just have to open up and it doesn't have to be so strictly corporate or like you've always done it. Um, you can find a way to influence people around you and, and, you know, make a living out of it. Fantastic. Uh, Chad, what about you? How did you handle people who were maybe not as supportive as, as you'd hoped? I think just being patient with people, um, as they've already said, just keep telling your story. And if you know that it's, that it's what you want to do, I think you just have to have faith in, you know, in yourself and in what you want to do and, and stay the course. Um, and then I think people will see, will see through your success and the change and the way it impacts you and, and your happiness and your fulfillment, you know, then they'll begin to believe. I mean, just some people just have to see it uh, to believe it, I think. And how about you, Donna? I might have gotten a little lucky on this front. I mentioned before that I spent 10 years as a professional actor, uh, leaving Dave, right out of Davidson. And so that was a 10 year career of hearing you're too tall, you're too short, you're too fat, you're too ugly. Everything was negative. I built the thickest skin. And so I, 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 I don't know, in some ways that was a little bit of a gift. Uh, because when I was deciding to do these things that a lot of people felt were a little wacky, I didn't give a lot of weight to the negativity. Excellent. Yeah. Great. So the next question that has come in, um, what has been the most helpful tool as you've made career changes? I'm not sure if they're referring, what kind of tool they're referring to, but... Um, Let's start, Donna, I'm gonna go ahead and lean back on you because maybe it's kind of a bigger question. Yeah, um, to me, the most helpful tool for anybody making a career change is to understand what are you really wanting? Uh, Cause it's really easy to call somebody up and say, hey, I'm job searching, but they don't know how to help you if you're too vague. And it's hard to get a family member to support you if you're wanting to work part time or take a leave of absence or start your own business if your intentions aren't really clear. So I would do the hard work to get very, very specific on exactly what is this ideal role description that you're trying to manifest, because everything else that is not that ideal role for you is a negotiation. So I would get a, a, do the work to get clear on that. See, one more question is coming through, and I am waiting for it to finish typing out. Hmm. What? So, I think that what they're trying to ask is if you're not really a risk taker, mm -hmm. how do you motivate yourself if you're just not happy in what you're doing right now? You know, you want a change what is the the best first step for someone who is, is like that? Chad, I'm going yeah, to go to you. Or Matt, go uh, ahead, please, Matt. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I think it happens, these things happen at different times. You know, I, I talking to a guy, client yesterday, Seattle, and um, he got let go by Deloitte, and um, mm -hmm. he really wasn't happy you know? And so part of them is like, yes, I'm out. Um, but now it's like, oh, shoot, what's next? Um, and so I think to some degree, like you want to be thinking about what your next position or job might be to some degree. That's not cheating on your current situation, um, but it's thinking about what else might be good for you in your life, um, career, fulfillment, what have you. But um, when it does happen, um, then quickly be able to lean into trusted people and, and be open-minded about a shift. So, you know, part of our talk yesterday, with this guy was um, 
you know, he's like, I might want to be a stay at home dad. And I might want to try to figure out how my wife and I can do that. I've never even thought about that. And my kids are three and eight and they're growing up so fast. And um, so, yeah, I think making sure that your relationships are strong and your well-being is top of mind, that will give you a little bit of um, strong foundation. So when setbacks happen, whether it be career wise or what have you, you you've got something to kind of lean into and, and build from. Which actually leads me to a Just question to, for you, Matt, specifically um, running from something versus heading to something better, like the concept of you want change because you're just not happy where you are versus I think there's an opportunity for me somewhere else, either a business or a new job. Um, how do you talk people through that? Is that to me? Yeah, that's for you. Oh, um, yeah, I think, you know, certainly I, Donna knows this and she spoke to it about is, you know, what, what's your purpose? What's your intentions? What are your core values? Um, and a lot of people I know don't like their corporate life. And that's not to say that corporate life is bad in general, but, you know, it has some stereotypes and it has some, some, some tough situations. Um, and I'll give you a good example. My oldest brother, not the one that went to Davidson, the one who went to Washington and Lee, he was um, uh, downsized a couple, two or three times by banks. And, you know, not his fault. It just happens, the economy or mergers, what have you. And he had five young kids, so kind of panic, um, but decided he his core really wanted to serve the country. And so he he's a, you know, he's a colonel in the army. Um, and, and I think he got a lot more value out of that. And it was kind of thrust upon him, but he had the bravery to go do it. Um, so I give people credit when they can take a, take a right turn um, and, and just be open-minded about things that are important to them. And if your work life is not good, it's not worth it. It really is not. It's, you, you only have this one life. And um, I'm a big believer. It's not work-life balance. It's life-work balance. So um, where, how do you feel away from work? And is work help making you not sleep well? Is it affecting your relationships? Is it affecting your health? Um, and, and if it is, it's, you don't have to do that. Um, I remember I had a one-on-one -on -one with a woman who runs a, a pretty good sized organization and kind of borderline panic attack on the phone with me about all the work she had, this and that. And I just said, stop, we're going to do some deep breathing. And I'm going to tell you something. And I said, you know what? You don't have to do this job. And it was like an epiphany. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it was like, oh my God, you're right. I said, I'm not telling you to quit because <laughs> your boss and your husband will kill me. But I am saying you don't have to do it, number one, but you can also do it in a really different way. So I just think everybody needs to take a slow down, take a time out and, and getting away from this idea that business, e busyness equals success. Agreed. Chad, look like you wanted to weigh in uh, before. Oh yeah, no, I was just gonna say, I mean, for the person who's asking about being risk averse too, as Matt said, you can, you know, you don't have to do it full time. You can lean into it. I mean, I started by just getting more involved, right, and teaching Sunday school and doing kind of all the things I might do. And then even my first five years of ordained life, I still was working full time. And I was a, um, I was a bivocational priest. So I basically, I donated my time to a small rural church that couldn't afford to pay a priest. And so I, it was very defined space. I was just there on Sunday mornings. And then uh, on Wednesday evenings. And so it, I could still work full time and do that and kind of, you know, test the water, see how it, see how it worked, make sure that I wanted to make the transition from working to being full time, you know, in, in the ordained ministry, but probably anything that you're thinking about doing, you can find ways to dip your toe in uh, and just to kind of ease your way in and then just keep turning it up and turning it up. Uh, I'm going to go back to you really quickly. Um, there's a question about ageism and mm. what experiences kind of at this point in our lives people are having as they want to make transitions. Um, how? What advice do you have someone who's either trying to make a career change 
and mm-hmm. stay in corporate life, for example, but mm-hmm. are struggling because they're having a hard time um, taking that next step because either no one will hire them or they haven't found the right opportunity. Okay, I have two pieces of advice on this question. It's a very insightful one. Uh, it is real. Uh, there is uh, many, many studies and more anecdotal evidence just from your friends and family uh, that ageism is a real thing. But there's two things that uh, I think are in your control. Number one is when you're out there looking at other companies, do your due diligence to find companies that have core values that will work really hard to not have ageism happen. So try to attach yourself in a pursuit of a company that you feel is going to be aligned to your own values. We all know that some corporate cultures are better than others. So find the ones where there is evidence that they are rewarding experience in the workplace. Number two is be really, really careful about your mindset. If you are going into an informational discussion or even into a formal interview and you've got one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake because you're already thinking that they are thinking that they have an age bias against you after they read your resume, you have already hurt yourself. So there is a... um, and th- the mindset here is really, really important and make sure that you're doing everything in your preparation to not go into a discussion like that with that onus on your shoulders that you think you're going to be discriminated against because of your age. It colors your body language. It colors your tone. It colors the stories that you tell about yourself and you're in control of that. All right, so we have time for one more question, and this is a good one. Um, any recommendations of podcasts or other sources of inspiration that you each might find helpful? Um, I'll start with you, Chad. Yeah, this is maybe a book um, I read this year called From Strength to Strength by Arthur Books. Um, it's it's <laughs> it looks great. Like Don knows it. Yeah, it, it's a great book, and it talks about a lot of the things we're talking about, just about how you're how your brain and the way you think and the way you work changes as, as you grow older and then challenging how you adapt the way that you work and the type of work you do and the way you think about work to adapt to the changes that are happening in all of our brains as we age. Um, and it's a great, it's just a great um, overview of this time of our life and, and how we view work um, and how our brains work. Uh, what about you, Matt? Um, I mean, speaking of books, I'm a big reader. Uh, I would say two or three that I've most enjoyed would be The Practice of Groundedness mm. by Brad Stolberg. And he's the guy I mentioned earlier. And he talks a lot about, he's a life coach and works with high, high, high level CEOs and, and everybody down below too, um, about purpose and balance in life and um, how to get peak performance, but do it sustainably. Um, I love that um, it's a classic, but don't sweat the small stuff. And it's all small stuff um, by Richard Carlson. Psychologist is really good about just recognizing that we worry too much because of our inherent negative bias in our minds. And um, that can lead to spirals and loops and lots of issues. Um, and then another book I really encourage is Resilient by Rick Hansen. Um, he's excellent. And, and then one more, got to get a female author in there, um, Mindset by Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, um, former Stanford, for, Stanford professor. She's excellent. And um, those are the four books that I would mention. And then you, Donna. I absolutely Obviously, your own book. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, yeah, that, that's a little cheap shot for me, isn't it? But I uh, I absolutely would say from strength to strength, the, the Arthur Brooks book uh, that, that Chad mentioned. It's also fabulous as an audio book. For those of you who like audio books, Arthur Brook narrates it himself. I um, mean, it's extremely well done. Um, the book that I mentioned, uh, my book is called Options or Power, and uh, but I have an awful lot of free resources available around the themes from that book. So if you private message me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to send you the links to that. Um, the podcast that I run is called The Me Suite is a play on C-suite. We're now in season five with over 200 um, interviews. Every single interview starts with the career professional answering the question, what are your core values and how how do they drive the key decisions in your life? 
and we have conversations about how we put work to work for us. It's a free resource that's available on all apps. So if you happen to be a podcast listener, listen to that one. There's also a woman named Liz Tinkham who runs a podcast called Third Act. And she deliberately is interviewing people about this critical decision that they're making about how do I get planful and thoughtful and intentional about work, what work will look like when I'm no longer working the grind? So you, you might be interested in that one as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists. You guys were fantastic. We appreciate your insights. So many of us are considering this journey. So um, I know we've got some great advice from you guys today and I appreciate all of your sharing. Um, just hearing real time, real life experiences is, is valuable to us. So thanks on behalf of all the Davidson community for being with us today and doing that. I'd also like to mention uh, that our classmate, Seth Jaffe, uh, class of 93, wrote a book on his experiences. It's called Career Recon. And we're going to make a link to this book available to you via email tomorrow. And uh, Seth told me that from tomorrow, May 24th through Friday, May 26th, he's making this, this download available uh, complimentary. So thank you for, uh, for that as well, Seth. And with that, um, I'm signing off. Grace, I'm going to pass it back to you. Yeah. Well, thank you all, Bonita, Chad, Matt, Donna, for such a valuable conversation. I know I learned a lot. Um, I'm sure it, it was incredibly um, valuable. So thank you so much for, ta for taking the time um, and spending it with us tonight. Um, I also want to say thank you to the class of, two, of 1993 Reunion Committee uh, for sponsoring this event. As Bonita said, we're going to send a follow-up email um, likely tomorrow. Uh, with the, in, with contact information for all of the panelists, um, a short survey, a link to that book that Bonina mentioned, um, and a few other pieces of helpful info. So be on the lookout for that. Um, a recording of this will also be on the um, website in the next few weeks um, so that you're able to refer back to it um, or share it with others who might have not been able to attend tonight. But thank you to all for coming. Thank you all to our panelists um, for such an incredible talk, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their evening.